If it's Monday, Kevin McCarthy's bid for speaker on the brink as House Republicans brace for an epic floor fight with a new Congress about to begin. Plus, President Biden is set to make his return to the White House this hour as the president and his party get ready for gridlock and governing chaos on Capitol Hill. And inside China's deadly COVID surge, with the country dealing with what's believed to be hundreds of millions of COVID infections amid global calls for more transparency. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Yami Shalsandor, in for Kristen Walker, at the beginning of a potentially historic week here in Washington, as the new Congress is set to convene for the first time tomorrow, bringing with it a new era of divided government. Right now, the incoming House Republican majority is in a state of disarray ahead of tomorrow's opening session, which could mean a level of Capitol Hill drama this town hasn't seen in 100 years, as a floor fight over who will be Speaker of the House. At the center of the drama is House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy. He needs nearly everyone in the GOP's razor-thin five-seat majority to vote for him in order to become Speaker. But he has a serious math problem on his hands, and he knows it. Over the weekend, McCarthy held a call with rank-and-file Republicans in an attempt to shore up support, but it doesn't appear to have worked. With just a handful of hours until the big vote, there still appears to be roughly five Republicans essentially saying they will never support McCarthy for speaker. One of them, Virginia Republican Bob Good, had this to say this morning. I won't be voting for Kevin McCarthy tomorrow. He's part of the problem. He's not part of the solution. There's nothing about Kevin McCarthy that indicates that he will bring the change that's needed to Washington or that's needed to the Congress, or he'll bring the fight, fight against the Biden-Schumer agenda and represent the interests of the voters who sent us to Washington to bring real change. In addition to the camp of Republican lawmakers who say they are hard no's, there are also an additional nine members who seem to be leaning no. Those nine sign on to a letter criticizing McCarthy's latest round of concessions as, quote, almost impossibly late to address continued deficiencies ahead of the new Congress. It's unclear what else McCarthy can give them after caving to pretty much every demand from this group of holdouts, ranging from everything from ending proxy voting and virtual hearings to mandatory to a mandatory 72 hour period to read bills and a change to allow any five members of the majority to call a vote to boot the sitting speaker. Bottom line, things could get ugly because in addition to the Republicans' disarray being on full display, if McCarthy doesn't have the votes to become speaker, well, who does? And beyond tomorrow, beyond tomorrow, Bendon Buck, a former aide to Republican speakers John Boehner and Paul Ryan, who also worked with McCarthy, is warning the country to buckle up, writing in the New York Times today that, quote, if Republicans aren't able to muster votes for a speaker, it will make very clear from the onset they cannot be counted on to fulfill the body's basic responsibilities, such as funding the government or preventing a credit default by lifting the debt ceiling, both of which will be required later this year. So welcome to the start of what could be days, weeks, and even months of messiness here in Washington. Joining me now from Capitol Hill is NBC's senior congressional correspondent, Garrett Hake. Also with me on set for more drama inside the Republican caucus is Audrey, Fall Audrey Fallberg. She covers Congress for the Dispatch. And NBC's Monica Alba is also with us outside the White House, where we're expecting President Biden to return this hour. So, Garrett, you're up there on Capitol Hill. How is Kevin McCarthy feeling right now? Well, I mean, it's tough to say. He's been mostly locked up in the Speaker's offices, of which he took possession over the weekend, although he has yet to earn the title, working the phones, meeting with staff, and trying to figure out what it's going to take to get those 14 kind of soft to hard no Kevin McCarthy votes into the yes or maybe camp, given that he can only afford to lose four of them. Our team caught up with the would-be Speaker outside his office. And listen for yourself and decide if you think this projects confidence. Do you have to speak the vote for speaker tomorrow? Are you prepared to make more concessions in exchange for more support? Hope you all have a very nice week. 
Mamish, these behind the scenes scrambles to lock down support for speakership aren't new. Remember, we went through something very similar with Speaker Pelosi between 2018 and the start of the Congress in 2019 when Democrats had retaken the majority and she had to lock up the votes. But there was none of this 11th hour concern about whether she had the votes when they were coming to the floor. We're in a position right now where we might, for the first time in a hundred years, not know who the Speaker of the House is going to be after the first ballot tomorrow. Uh, it's incredible to see Kevin McCarthy sort of walking down those stairs, knowing that he's moved into the Speaker's office already. So, Audrey, you've been talking to, to members. You're all in this when it comes to what Republican, what the Republican caucus is thinking. So tell us what your reporting shows. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for having me on. I think it seems pretty obvious at this point, right, that um, you're going to see a situation tomorrow and potentially for a number of days where there are multiple rounds of counting. And I think that this is kind of what happens, right, when you see um, a decade-long quest for the speakership um, from McCarthy when that conflicts with an immovable object, which is the Freedom Caucus. They've really signaled that they're not going to relent on their demands and that um, even what McCarthy's given them so far is just kind of too little too late. Um, and so there are five basically confirmed no votes, but we might get, um, you know, several more, as you've already suggested from that letter that came out. Um, they're really frustrated by McCarthy. Bob Good has suggested that they're, you know, in, during the second uh, round of, of counting, they're gonna, there's going to be another potential challenger to come around. It doesn't seem like there's much support for Andy Biggs at this point, um, but he's de declined to name who, who that will be. So it's, it's going to be an exciting and kind of chaotic day tomorrow. And all this chaos is happening. It is also exciting, frankly, but all of this chaos is happening as Donald Trump, um, he was seen as someone who might tank Kevin McCarthy's House speakership, but in fact, he's supporting them. So how is this possible? Square that for us. What are you hearing from these members who are not on board if pre former President Trump is, is, is trying to get support for Kevin McCarthy here? You're right that that adds a fascinating dynamic. Frankly, they don't really talk that much about Trump as much as, you know, but right before the holidays, I actually caught up with Bob Good and chatted with him about this. And he warned that there were going to be many, many more people kind of coming out um, against uh, McCarthy, um, that they'd either told the Freedom Caucus wing or told the leader himself. And um, as that clip just showed us, he doesn't seem particularly confident in his chances. I think one really fascinating dynamic about all of this is just the fact that centrists have really stood by him for, for weeks now. A lot of them are wearing those uh, only Kevin uh, pins in the halls of Congress. Um, you know, he really made an effort to fundraise for them on the campaign trail, um, to focus on that commitment for America and really try to get everybody a, a seat at the table, right? Right. The fact that these centrists are standing by him is really fascinating. And one House Republican actually told me this morning um, that, you know, they're really actually frustrated with McCarthy, the fact that he's willing to, quote, negotiate with terrorists, meaning the, uh, you know, the House Freedom Caucus. So they're, they're kind of, they don't know what's going to happen tomorrow either, centrists. Definitely big questions. And Monica, uh, you're there with, waiting for the president to come back from his vacation in the, in the Virgin Islands. I wonder what the White House, your White House sources are saying that they're bracing for. And I wonder what they make of all this drama. Are they just sitting back and watching or what are you hearing? Yeah, that's definitely, I think, a good way to put it, Yamish. They are happy to let this drama continue to unfold within the Republican Party, one that they have continued to talk about as having this major identity crisis, as continuing to not have have a clear narrative or path forward. So they are content to let that play out. But it's happening at the same time as President Biden is getting ready to make this huge pitch, they say, for bipartisanship and trying to make the case that Washington is only going to be able to get things done if Republicans and Democrats can find a couple of areas to work together on. And he's going to use what happened in the last year and a half with the CHIPS manufacturing bill and the bipartisan infrastructure law to try to make that case. And on Wednesday, he's going to be appearing alongside Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell in Kentucky. And that is a rare event for the two to be at this official unveiling of more than $1.6 billion that's going to go toward this all-important interstate crossing bridge between Kentucky and Ohio. So President Biden is also going to be there with the Republican governor of Ohio, Mike DeWine, again, trying to say that when Democrats and Republicans come together, a lot can get accomplished. But as you see there, Air Force One just landing at Joint Base Andrews returning from that vacation where we didn't see very much of President Biden. He was taking time with his family to, in his words, they were going to talk about what might come next, these big 2024 discussions that have been looming. But he joked to some reporters a couple of days ago when they asked him how those conversations were going, he said, what, like there's an election happening or something? So he's happy to step back, let other 
things progress before he's going to make any big declaration. But again, we know from our sources and conversations even with the First Lady that all signs point to yes, that they're going to gear up for another bid. But they're going to try to make 2023 about this bipartisanship effort, trying to say here might be some other things we can accomplish and work on together. And one of the areas where we may see this in terms of the conversation about Congress is in a State of the Union address, which the White House says in the coming weeks, the president will put a major focus on bipartisanship there. And again, trying to tout these things that did work when both parties came together, how they'll be able to point to implemented with the example of this infrastructure law, Yamish. Uh, quite a split screen when you think of Mitch McConnell and President Biden um, getting ready to go to, to Kentucky. And of course, the president just landing there um, in joint place, Arab Andrews. But Garrett, I want to come back to you and, and left off, come off in some ways off of what Audrey was talking about, which is this idea that there are these hardliners. It seems that they're not really moved by the concessions that Kevin McCarthy is making. So tell me a bit more about how this call went, these calls that, that Kevin McCarthy's been having with this caucus. How are they going? What's the math looking like on your end? Well, they're not getting the job done is the bottom line. They're not moving the needle. I mean, McCarthy has made a number of changes to the rules process, things that make it easier to be a backbencher, a conservative member, a member of the Freedom Caucus, and to still have input on the legislative process. In doing so, he has, in the, in the thinking of a lot of the moderates who tend to support him, weakened the powers of the speakership. He has given away the powers of the job that he is trying to maintain. Now, it's worth noting, uh, if you really want to nerd out here a little bit, these rules that McCarthy McCarthy has talked about changing that he's put forward. You only vote on that rules package after a speaker is elected. And what we've heard from some of these moderates is, yeah, look, we'll go along with this if it gets Kevin McCarthy the gavel. But if conservatives tank McCarthy, try to install one of their own people, you might have another fight to come still on the rules package. And so there's a lot of this behind the scenes back and forth to try to come up to, you know, a Goldilocks zone here where you might have a selection of McCarthy or someone else. Now, the problem with the someone else theory is I think the two most likely candidates to be speaker, if it's not Kevin McCarthy, are Steve Scalise, the current House Majority Leader, the number two in the House, or Jim Jordan, both of whom back Kevin McCarthy publicly and have consistently done so. If you'd have told Kevin McCarthy six months ago he'd be coming into this speaker's election with a House majority, Steve Scalise, Jim Jordan, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and Donald Trump all supporting him, and he still wouldn't have it locked up, I don't think he would have believed you. But this is the situation where he finds himself. It's just incredibly uh, challenging going forward because there's not that much left in the store to give away. It's, it's an incredible place that Kevin McCarthy finds himself in. And Audrey, I want to come back to you. Um, talk to me a bit about what this is really all about. Is this personal animosity? Is it trust issues? When you talk to the, the House Republican Caucus, what, what is the bottom line here that makes Kevin McCarthy end up in this position? Sure, absolutely. I mean, he spent the entire campaign trail promising that there would be a really big red wave. There wasn't. He won the majority, which was, you know, centrists constantly remind reporters of that, and that's why they're kind of sticking by him. But the fact of the matter is that he has an incredibly slim majority, and um, he knows that the numbers, you know, this, it's better to work with centrists rather than this Freedom Caucus wing that's just simply not going to work with Democrats on anything. Um, remember that uh, House Republicans are going to have to work with Democrats um, to, to win over that, you know, 60-vote th threshold in, in the Senate and get anything to Biden's desk. Um, um, and I think that that's why we're going to see so much focus next Congress, no matter who the speaker is, on oversight, right? Republicans are going to focus more on, you know, the chaotic uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan, um, possibly investigating Hunter Biden's son um, rather than actual legislating. Um, but there are huge trust issues in the dynamic, I think, that in the House GOP conference. For sure. And, and when you think about that, Garrett, I want to ask you another quick question, which is how different is this than what happened to Kevin McCarthy last, last time around when he was trying to be speaker? Well, I think the key difference is in that election, he pulled out before it got to the floor. And I think that um, should tell us a little bit something about how he's approaching this today, right? I mean, those were personal challenges that he had. It was a lot of the same foils, a lot of the same hard right Republicans who had issues with him. But I think the two key differences now as to then are there's no obvious consensus pick that's going to come out of the woodwork here. There is no Paul Ryan waiting in the wings. Set aside your fantasy speaker predictions of somebody who might be a non-member of the House, a former member of the House, uh, who's going to come waltzing in to save Republicans. It's never happened before. I think it's highly unlikely to happen now. That's a key difference. And the other is he has come this close before and lost. And I've covered Congress for a while now. I've never seen a member 
pursue the speakership, pursue any leadership title with the kind of single-minded focus that Kevin McCarthy has had on becoming speaker ever since he rose to the top slot on the Republican side after Paul Ryan left. This has been his single goal, and I don't see him stepping aside easily now. And talking about goals, Monica, uh, there's also, of course, the bipartisanship that President Biden has really tried to pursue. You talked earlier about the idea that he's going to be in Kentucky with Mitch McConnell. Does this White House, do the White House officials think they can get some big bipartisan bills through with a House that is controlled by Republicans? Well, they would say they do believe that, and the president is the eternal optimist here. But when you ask them to really make a list of those priorities and some of those areas, well, that becomes a little bit trickier. So that's why you're going to see them focus on what they will point to as having been successful with these laws that, again, now the economic initiatives, they're actually coming to fruition. And you can see some of the benefits, his advisors say, and that is what they're going to try to argue is effective. And so what other areas? Well, when we talk about things like potential potential immigration reform. We know there was an effort at the end of last year that didn't work. When we talk about gun safety, things like that, I mean, these are really, really difficult, thorny issues that, of course, the White House says they would love to work with Republicans on, but it's just not entirely clear yet where they're going to put a lot of that political capital, what the big agenda ticket item will be in the coming months. I think we can expect to learn a little bit more about that in the President's State of the Union address. That's why that speech is going to be so critical in the coming weeks. But again, this is a White House that's going to say we're willing to work with Republicans. We have in the past. If they don't want to work with us now, that's on them. Yamish? Well, certainly a, a fascinating situation. And of course, we're seeing live pictures there of President Biden, who has now come back to, to Washington, D.C. on his way back to the White House. Um, thank you so much for all of your reporting. We're clearly going to keep watching this Kevin McCarthy vote battle. Um, Garrett, Audrey, and Monica, thank you so much. And coming up, getting ready for gridlock. We'll dive into the biggest issues facing both parties as a new era begins here in Washington. Plus, Moscow reports dozens of fatalities after Ukrainian rock rockets strike Russian-occupied territory amid a new wave of drone attacks in Kyiv. We'll have a live report from Ukraine ahead. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As we noted, Kevin McCarthy has made a number of concessions to his Republican colleagues in an attempt to win enough votes to become House Speaker. But according to one anonymous House Republican, it still might not be enough. That lawmaker told Politico, quote, the problem is people don't trust Kevin McCarthy and a number won't vote for him. Those are just the facts. The list of demands that we offered was not for guaranteed support, but rather the kinds of things that might move some of his detractors. So joining me now on set is Washington Post congressional reporter Camilla DeTalis. There's also former New York Democratic congressman and former member of the House Democratic leadership, Joe Crowley, and also Republican strategist at NBC News political analyst Rick Tyler. So thank you all for being here. Camilla, I want to start with you, and I want to just read to you what one Republican House member described the situation right now. He said, we're supposed to be hitting the ground running here, but instead it's just a big belly flop. I mean, those are the tough words that you're hearing from Republicans. So what are you hearing from your Republican sources, from Republican lawmakers, about this seemingly disastrous start to the House Republican majority, them controlling the House right now? That's a great question. I don't think anyone expected that in December all these things would come to light about George Santos and his previous background, but also just this like struggle that you see within the Republican Party themselves of trying to come together and unify over their messaging and what they actually want to accomplish in the next year. I think a lot of things have really distracted from them agreeing, having differences about whether to support Ukraine next year and the funding going on there, but then also what kind of investigations they want to do. But there's been a lot of things that come out in light, and this is really a really big time for them right now to come together and really get on the same page about what they want to do going forward. I mean, it's they're trying to get on the same page, Rick. Um, but you also have Kevin McCarthy just offering concession after concession. Is he offering too much? Is he possibly going to be too weak as speaker if he gets this? I don't think Kevin should be offering anything. Kevin McCarthy raised over half a billion dollars in the last session. He probably raised more money for the, fun, for the Freedom Caucus uh, than they raised for themselves and helped get them reelected. 
Uh, look, this all this should should have take place in in the caucus, right? They, they they put up Kevin McCarthy as a nominee. 188 Republicans voted for him. That is what the caucus decided. And so now you have these turncoats who are are not going to go with their party, with their team, uh, and they're going to not just betray Kevin McCarthy. They're going to betray the entire Republican Party. And uh, to your point exactly. Uh, you can't hit the ground running. You can't get anything that the Freedom Caucus wants to go. And, and, and ideologically, I'm more aligned with them. Uh, but practically, when, when it's politics and you have to win, you got to have, in the end, you got to have enough votes. So if you want to be a majority with a conservative majority, then elect more conservative members. They didn't do that. So you're going to have Kevin McCarthy to go forward. And if you can't do that, then get off the team. And, Joe, you're, you're shaking your head here. I know a lot of Democrats are happy to just watch this happen, but I wonder, <laughs> in your mind, um, does this have any sort of echoes of what happened to Democrats when we saw um, four years ago people sort of arguing about the speakership there, even though House, even though Speaker Nancy Pelosi was pretty clear that she was going to be Speaker. Yeah. But tell me, do you see any echoes there, any similarities? Yeah, there's always some similarities to, to, to all of this. But I think at the end of the day, Nancy Pelosi, no, Nancy Pelosi knew when she got to the floor that she had the votes. And I think that's, that's the critical part here. It's not clear whether Kevin McCarthy knows or will know that he has the votes tomorrow when this vote starts taking place. And let's be clear as well. I mean, the Republican Party has been, uh, the, the caucus, the, the conference itself has been very divided. Um, and that's not new. That's, that's, that's something that has been developing for quite some time. You can say the same thing about Democrats, but it's even more profound, I think, within the, Demo within the Republican conference. And that's what's bubbling through. The fact that you have, you know, five people saying they will not vote for them under any circumstances, Lis listening to the representative from Virginia just a moment ago, it sounded pretty, pretty hard there, that there's hard to move. But we, both, we all know the speaker has incredible assets and tools at his or her disposal. And I still think it's Kevin McCarthy's to lose. It's Kevin McCarthy's to lose. That's what Joe's saying. Rick, do you think he can get to 218? Do you think? And if he does, how does he get there? He doesn't need 218 to win. Nancy Pelosi did not win with 218 votes. She won with 216 votes. John Bader did not win with 218 votes. He won with 216 votes. But that would require someone to agree to leave the floor and not vote. Um, so whether those are Democrats or whether they, the Freedom Caucus decides, look, I'm going to, after voting against Kevin McCarthy in the first round, uh, we'll sit it out for the next round and then he'll be speaker. But I think it's an incredibly weak way to start. And it's really a terrible thing to do to your own, your own party when you're starting out. But can he get the votes, you think? In yeah, your I mind? think, oh, I think Kevin McCarthy will be speaker. And Camila, there's also this idea and this question of George Santos. How does he, how much does he complicate this? He's someone who, of course, has been accused of lying about all sorts of things from his family history to its finances, but he's supporting Kevin McCarthy. So what's the complication there? See, across the board, you have different Republicans that have now come out, either going to his defense, saying that he should still deserve to take office and we should see, judge him more on the policies that he sets forth rather than just what he said in the past. But then you have others saying that he should seriously consider stepping down and that's a real possibility. But on the terms of ethics investigations for going forward and what Congress could do, there were the small rules that have been put into legislation that Republicans might not go forward with having the Office of Congressional Ethics and that would really weaken the committees, the House Ethics Committee's ability to, to actually carry out investigations. You know, some people have called them toothless in itself that they really haven't been as effective as they should. Uh, but going forward, I mean, this is really going to set the tone of whether Republicans will allow this. But ultimately, we've heard from Democrats saying that he, there should be investigations going forward. You know, federal prosecutors are looking into him. Um, but it's still unclear about how what Congress will really do if he is sworn into office. And Joe, I'm asking about another story that Democrats would also like you to sit back and watch. But I, I'll ask you, do you think you see any scenario where George Santos resigns? Well, I think the only thing George Santos has not been accused of is telling the truth. And it's a real problem for the Republican conference going forward in terms of the precedent that's been set here, he, he didn't embellish his resume. He has lied about every aspect of his personal life, his professional life, and his political life. Uh, he's not who he says he is. I'm not even sure his name is George Santos. Which makes him a very unreliable vote for speaker. Absolutely. <laughs> for, for anything down the road, any right. vote you have. Right, exactly. And then, well, Rick, we have, you have, of course, Kevin Brady, who said... He should consider possibly resigning. What's your, what are your thoughts? Do you see any scenario where he resigns? I don't think he'll resign. Uh, but look, the system will eventually work because somebody will primary him or the Democrats will win that seat the, the, the last time. I, I'm 
not sure he expected to win the seat in the mm -hmm. first place. Um, so it'll it'll work itself out. He's embarrassed himself. I mean, the honorable thing for him to do is resign. But that's ultimately going to be up to him and his voters. And his election was a failure all across the board. The candidate against him who di didn't press us enough, the local media, they didn't press it, the resources. We were talking earlier about uh, going and investigating um, these, 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 these things that had bubbled up. Uh, but it was a failure all around in terms of his getting to this point in the first place. Where yeah, and as a, as a former Newsday reporter, I've been calling a lot of my former colleagues at Long Island to say, how did you guys miss this? I mean, obviously, I think it's a big question. I also want to ask you, Joe, about this, the, the White House. Uh, you know, President Biden, he's going to be going to Kentucky. He's going to be standing alongside Mitch McConnell. Mm -hmm. what, are your, what are your thoughts on that decision and what the White House should be doing now that we're in this new era of divided well, government? I, I think it really goes along this line that, the President Biden has been saying all along he wants to be viewed as bipartisan. He wants to work, I think, uh, with Mitch McConnell. Uh, he was a man of the Senate. He, is, he, he knows it backwards and forwards. He's known McConnell for many, many years. I, I think it also it's, it speaks to McConnell as well to some degree. I think he recognizes um, that, you know, the old tactics haven't worked. Uh, and maybe this is an opportunity for him to have even more of an imp input in, in moving forward, especially as we move to this election year. We know one person d that, that uh, Mitch McConnell does not want to be the presidential candidate, and that is Donald Trump. Certainly, certainly. And talking about Donald Trump, Camila, there's, of course, Donald Trump is now talking about um, blaming Republicans and in particular blaming their poor showing in November on abortion. I want to read to you a part of it of what he said. He said, it wasn't my fault. The Republicans didn't live up to the expectations in the midterms. I was 233 to 20. To 20. Um, he said abort it was the abortion issue poorly handled by Republicans, especially those firmly insistent on no exceptions. We know, of course, that former President Donald Trump was critical to Roe v. Wade being overturned. So how do you square that? What, what do you see as former President Trump blaming this on Republicans? This is what we've seen time and time again when it's come to Trump and whether he's going to take ownership or any accountability in the role that he played in the outcome of the elections, especially when the primaries where some of the candidates that he supported won. You saw him very boastfully trying to take credit for that. But then the candidates that he thought were a short thing, like Herschel Walker in Georgia and him not winning and people saying, well, you know, it's because Trump didn't speak that much about him. Um, you're going to see this time and time again because he is running, trying to run for office again in 2024. And he's in this position where all eyes are on him and whether he's still effective in the Republican Party and can galvanize voters to really go out and support Republicans and especially him. So you're, you're going to see this, this rhetoric, but it's not on the abortion topic. It was across the board on a lot of things and messaging that Republicans did on inflation, on the economy, um, on crime. That, those were huge things I heard from voters time and time again on this upcoming election. And it really did come, come down to individual races and how effective the candidates themselves were. Yeah. Yeah, definitely uh, uh, something to watch about why the results of the midterms were the way they were. A lot we got through here. So thank you so much to the panel, to Camila, to Joe, to Rick. Thank you so much. And up next, new details in the Times Square machete attack that left three officers injured on New Year's Eve. But first, we want to take a moment to pay tribute to Barbara Walters. She was a trailblazing journalist who spent more than half a century in broadcast news. Throughout her iconic career, Barbara Walters shattered glass ceiling after glass ceiling, breaking barriers in an industry once dominated by men and paving the way for today's female journalists. She was the first ever woman to co-host on NBC's Today Show and later the first woman to anchor in a network evening news broadcast. In a tweet on Saturday, President Biden said, quote, Barbara Walters has always been an example of bravery and truth breaking barriers while driving our nation forward. Her legacy will continue as an inspiration for all journalists. Barbara Walters conducted hundreds of interviews with newsmakers from the world of politics, sports and entertainment. She was famous for asking tough questions and sometimes uncomfortable questions and for getting some of the world's most famous people to reveal parts of themselves the public had not seen before. Here she was on Meet the Press back in February. February 1976, pressing then the Prime Minister of Israel. We'll have the first questions now from Barbara Walters of NBC News. Mr. Prime Minister, you have repeatedly said in your speeches that a militarily strong Israel is necessary to maintain the peace. Now, the Pentagon and the CIA have reported after their military analysis that Israel is more than strong enough to deter any Arab aggression. Were you able to convince Congress and President Ford, those who are responsible for deciding military aid to Israel, that you are right and that the CIA and the Pentagon are wrong? Well, first I would like to thank the CIA and the Pentagon for complimenting 
as well for its military strengths. But I believe that uh, we need more than compliments. We need hard work. Mr. Prime Minister, we've heard these arguments now back and forth for a year. And I'd like to get back to my very first question which was, how do you expect to have a Geneva conference reconvened without the PLO? Can you give us any sign, any hope, any direction? Can you realistically be specific about one new action that's going to break the stalemate, the same conversation back and forth that we have heard from a year? Has anything happened in this week, or are things basically the way they were before you came to this country? I believe that there are basically two options, how to move towards peace. Incredible to watch her do her work. Barbara Walters died on Friday in New York City. She was 93 years old. Welcome back. A 19-year-old from Maine has now been charged with two counts of attempted murder of a police officer and two counts of attempted assault after he allegedly attacked three officers near Times Square Saturday night, just hours before the new year. Officials said the suspect approached one officer outside a Times Square checkpoint shortly after 10 p.m. and attempted to strike him over the head with a machete. The suspect then struck two officers before he was shot in the shoulder and detained. The officers were injured in the attack but were released from the hospital early Early Sunday morning. The police and FBI are still investigating the suspect, 19-year-old Trevor Bickford. According to officials, Bickford made pro-jihadist statements from his hospital bed after the attack and had expressed militant support for extremist Islam in the past. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park has more from Times Square. So Kathy, thank you so much for, for covering this for us. What more do we know about this attack and the potential motive here? Yeah, so Yamish, we know that the suspect is currently uh, still hospitalized at this hour. It's unclear when he will be released, but obviously the investigation is intensifying. And as of now, we know that the suspect was on the radar of law enforcement, even though he didn't have a criminal history. In fact, one of his family members alerted authorities a couple of weeks ago, and therefore he was in a federal database. And also officials were able to retrieve a couple of his personal belongings, a backpack. Uh, and in that backpack, there was cash. Uh, a pocket knife, as well as terrorist propaganda. You mentioned that while he was in his hospital bed this weekend, he expressed jihadist views. Um, well, apparently that relative who alerted authority said that um, he expressed those same sentiments at that time as well. So obviously still a lot of questions tonight. Um, but as far as a motive, it's still unclear what motivated him to carry out this alleged attack. And Kathy, as that question is still trying to be answered, what's the next phase here in this investigation, given the fact that he's been charged, but the FBI and other agencies, they're still trying to get at unanswered questions like that one. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously it's it's a multi-agency effort. You have federal and local authorities looking into this. We know that yesterday on Sunday, uh, the FBI was seen at his family home in Maine. So we're still kind of waiting to, to figure out exactly what they were able to uncover uh, during that visit. But federal charges are possible at this stage. Well, right now he is facing those charges of attempted assault and attempted murder. Yamish? Certainly serious charges. Thank you so much, Kathy Park, for that reporting. And now turning to across the country to the West Coast, where parts of California are dealing with massive flooding to start the new year. At least three people have died as rainfall from a Pacific storm has flooded the northern part of the state. You're looking at video here from a man stuck in his neighborhood as water blocked the street. The National Weather Service has flood warnings in effect for multiple counties surrounding the state's capital of Sacramento. Dozens of drivers in rural Sacramento County had to be rescued from their cars yesterday as floodwaters swept Highway 99. The storms also hit San Francisco, shutting down roads and leaving mud and debris behind. But this is, of course, California, so at least some people are making the best of the situation, and you want to wait for this, taking the opportunity to use their paddle boards. After the break... China, once again at the center of a COVID surge as questions swirl around just how deadly the outbreak will be. New reporting from on the ground in Beijing next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. In a New Year's address, Chinese President Xi Jinping said China is entering, quote, a new phase of COVID response and acknowledged, quote, 
tough challenges remain. China appears to be experiencing a massive surge in COVID infections as the country abruptly reopens after nearly three years of lockdowns and a strict zero COVID policy. The policy change came after widespread protests late last year. And there are now global concerns about China's lack of transparency about how widespread this COVID outbreak is and how much worse it could get. NBC's Chanice Mackie Freyer is on the ground with us with the latest. As China begins to reopen, streets and cities like Beijing are getting busy again, but so too are the hospitals, with China's own experts bracing for 800 million people to be infected with COVID by spring and infections in rural areas yet to peak. China is being overwhelmed by a massive COVID surge. Hospital emergency rooms packed with patients who are mostly older, weak and struggling. Resources appearing to be stretched so thin, the sick often lying on lawn chairs instead of hospital beds. They have beds in the lobby, near the elevators, in the hallways. They're running out of places to put people. The size and scope of COVID infections remains unclear here because of little credible information and the way China's government counts COVID deaths. There are too many, says this funeral provider, about demand. Near one hospital, we've seen empty caskets stacked in an alley. Officially, China has recorded only 18 COVID deaths during the past month. In the hospital, we, we are a little bit suspicious. We see a lot of patient with complication. We know that the ICU and other hospitals are full of patients. COVID has been barreling through the country for weeks. After widespread protests in November over lockdowns and testing, China abruptly dropped its tough zero COVID rules in December. Border restrictions imposed nearly three years ago are set to be lifted next week. The whiplash changes here have seen cities go from harsh lockdowns to jam streets on New Year's Eve as people begin to recover from COVID and hope the country's economy does too. Chinese President Xi Jinping acknowledging the pandemic's toll during an annual speech. It has not been an easy journey for anyone, he said. Yet the lack of data out of China has scientists elsewhere guessing about new and dangerous COVID variants. Incredibly important reporting. So Janice Mackie Freyer, thank you so much. And joining me now on set is Emily Fang. She's Beijing correspondent for NPR. Emily, you've of course been covering China's COVID response. What are you hearing from your sources about how things are going there? And is it your understanding that people are starting to try to take advantage of some of these restrictions being lifted or is that not happening because of this new surge? It's a mixed bag, right? People are thrilled that they can live without restrictions again. Tourism bookings abroad are booming because there's no inbound quarantine. So people can finally travel outside the country. But at the same time, you have this massive surge. And what Janice is reporting is absolutely true. We've been hearing the same. Hospitals completely overwhelmed, ICU beds completely full. Families I've spoken to tell me that the ambulances can't keep up. So if you have a sick family member who needs to get to the hospital, it's several hours wait before an ambulance can come and take you. And they're being told by hospitals, bring your own beds and have family members come and take care of the sick because we don't have enough nurses to go around and no gurneys to go around. That's how short supplies are in the capital. You can imagine it's probably even worse in the countryside and smaller cities. I mean, that's incredible, um, Emily. And I wonder... What are you hearing about who this surge is impacting most? It's the elderly. And the reason for that is, of course, they're susceptible to the virus, but there's also a very low vaccination rate in the country for the elderly. There was a lot of suspicion over how healthy the vaccines were. China's had numerous vaccine scandals in the past where vaccines were faulty and they actually made people sick or even killed them. Also, you had zero COVID policy for almost three years in China. And so you basically didn't have really any infections in the country. And people didn't see a reason to get a vaccine that they didn't trust if they didn't see people around them getting sick. It's only until now that we see infections rising. And unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of preparation to vaccinate people and stock up hospitals. And I want to emphasize, you know, the scenes that we're seeing in China are sadly really familiar to us in the U.S. and Europe, basically every country that dealt with COVID surges in the last two and a half years. The difference is 
China had almost three years to prepare. They knew what this surge would look like by looking at other countries, and unfortunately, their preparations just were not enough. And tell me, why wasn't the country prepared enough? And in particular, what are they doing to try to, to, to combat the vaccine hesitancy as part, that's going to be part of this, of course? One of the reasons why they were not prepared enough is because all of their resources, all of their human power and financial capital went into preventing the virus from even entering the country. So you had really strict border controls, you had very strict testing, and sudden and drastic lockdowns. All of that took a lot of money, and there wasn't a lot of attention paid on actually treating the virus once it inevitably made it into the country. And so now you're starting to see vaccination campaigns and a big message to go and get your booster shot. But unfortunately, you know, about a third of people above the age of 80 haven't gotten their booster shot in China. Um, as you, and as you think about sort of those vaccination rates, I wonder how much the protests and people taking to the streets in ways that seem like the world had not seen before, how much did that play into these COVID restrictions being lifted? How much exactly? we will never know because the U-turn on COVID policy was so sudden that it surprised a lot of people in the public health apparatus, even in China. But I suspect that they probably had figures that show just how quickly the latest surge in China was spreading in early December. You know, these numbers of up to 800 million people being infected by spring, those didn't come out of nowhere. So these outbreaks were happening and people in China knew that the Omicron variant is much more infectious than the other variants they were dealing with. And so I suspect if they could have used the same methods they used before, lockdowns testing, to contain this outbreak, they would have. But they knew that's just not humanly possible this time and they let the dam go. And a quick question as we wrap up here. I wonder the World Health Organization, it's pushing for China, like other countries, to release real-time COVID data. Is your understanding that that might happen or is it just not how China functions? It's not how it functions. It likes secrecy. It likes to cover things up. But I suspect they also don't have the data themselves. They've dismantled a lot of the public testing booths. Hospitals are so overwhelmed that they can't, they can't process or wait for the results. So they don't even have accurate numbers themselves. And they're struggling to keep up with the numbers of people who are sick coming in. Well, such critical reporting um, by you. So thank you so much for joining us, Emily. Thank you for having me. And turning now to the tensions on the Korean peninsula. According to state media, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is now calling for the country to expand its nuclear arsenal and develop new inter intercontinental ballistic missiles. Just hours before the announcement, North Korea fired a short-range ballistic missile off its east coast. Kim Jong-un's announcement also comes just days after North Korean drones violated South Korea's airspace, forcing Seoul to scramble fighter jets. In response to Kim's declaration, South Korea's president said the country's military must be ready to retaliate against any provocation from North Korea. And the South Korean Defense Ministry warned attempts to use nuclear force will, quote, lead to the end of Kim Jong-un's regime. And still to come, mounting Russian fatalities and emergency power outages in Ukraine's capital city after a violent weekend in the war. We're on the ground in Kyiv with more after a quick break. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. 2023 could be the year that more state legislatures make moves on abortion laws following the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Some states may move to codify access, while others may move to institute new restrictions. And the start of the new year means new laws are going into effect in states across the country on abortion and a whole lot of other things. Beginning yesterday, Tennessee's law banning abortion pills by mail or at pharmacies went into effect. In Missouri and Maryland, recreational marijuana will now be legal in 2023 after those states approved ballot measures in November. And 23 states plus D.C. will increase their minimum wages in 2023. Those increases will range from 23 cents to $1.50 per hour, are expected to impact more than 8 million workers. Meanwhile, in Illinois, just hours before it was set to go into effect, the state's Supreme Court stopped a provision that would eliminate cash bail. NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian takes a look at some of the other state laws now in effect. Anyone shopping for a new mink coat in California will soon be out of luck. That state will become the first to ban the sale and production of most products made from animal fur. Let's call it what it is, a barbaric kill for no purpose other than vanity. The law bars residents from selling or making fur clothing, shoes, or handbags, though it doesn't apply to leather, used items, or those used for religious or tribal purposes. California is also repealing a law this year against jaywalking. 
Under the Freedom to Walk Act, pedestrians may cross the street outside of an intersection without being ticketed as long as it's safe to do so. Before, jaywalkers in California could receive a fine of up to $198. In Kentucky, the so-called Get Back to Work law will significantly restrict eligibility for unemployment benefits. Supporters say it's needed to help employers fill vacant job openings. I can tell you as a small business owner, we, we cannot find help. Critics say it will hurt struggling residents. In Michigan, the state will begin automatically expunging people's criminal records after seven years for misdemeanors and 10 years for felonies, unless the crimes are really serious. It's in response to concerns that people are being unfairly denied employment over minor offenses. Alaska is changing what it means to consent to sex in that state. The previous law required a use of force to prove sexual assault. Now, consent must be positively expressed by word or action. If at any point what you're doing doesn't feel comfortable, you can change your mind. And that is okay. That is your right. Alabama will no longer require a permit to carry a concealed handgun, becoming one of 31 open carry states. The new law also allows gun owners over 21 to take their firearms into state parks without the written permission previously required. <laughs> And back in California, a new law makes the Lunar New Year a state holiday. Important in Asian American communities, the day falls between January 21st and February 21st, marking the first new moon. Ken Delanian, NBC News, Washington. And thank you so much for that reporting, Ken Delanian. Turning now to the war in Ukraine, where dozens of Russian troops were killed in what could be one of the deadliest attacks since the start of the war. According to a Telegram post by Russia's Ministry of Defense, 63 Russian servicemen died after Ukraine launched four U.S.-supplied rockets into Russian-occupied Ukraine. Earlier today, Ukraine's armed forces announcing they conducted strikes in that region, claiming to destroy up to 10 units of military equipment and are working on clarifying the number of persons now killed. The attack on Russian troops comes after consecutive days of attacks on Ukraine's capital of Kyiv. Ukraine's military saying they shot down Russian missiles and drones on New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, and overnight today. Joining me now is NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley, who is in Kyiv. So tell us how significant is this attack on Russia? What more do we know about it? It's very significant, Yamish, as you mentioned, probably one of the deadliest attacks, single attacks that we've seen in months, maybe even since the beginning of the war. And one of the interesting things that we've also seen is that this has really aroused a whole lot of criticism from within Russia, where, of course, we don't see a lot of criticism of the war. It's kind of outlawed um, and it's actually not even allowed to be called a war. And now we're seeing pro-nationalist pro-military bloggers and other commentators, many of whom have connections to the military and intelligence in Russia, criticizing the war, demanding investigations as to why these troops were left in such a vulnerable location. There's some talk that maybe there might have been a lot of ammunition nearby. We can't confirm that, of course. We can't even confirm the exact number of fatalities. But this is a arousing outrage and just round and round of recriminations in Russia. And that is significant. That could have an effect on how this war is waged as we go into 2023. Yamish? Certainly a significant development. Matt, I also want to ask you about Russia's continued attacks. We saw a number of them over the holiday weekend. What do we know about their weapons stockpile, the sort of pace of these attacks, and what they're thinking as we go into this new year? Yeah, I mean, the pace of the attack has de the attacks have definitely picked up because remember, all of this started back in the fall. These rounds and rounds of Ukraine of Russian strikes against Ukrainian electricity infrastructure, mainly in Kyiv and throughout the country that used to be maybe once a week. Now, just this week, we've seen it every day for about five days. So that's a big uptick. And we just heard from President Vladimir Zelensky. He said that there were 80 drones fired just since the beginning of the year. And he said that we can expect another round of prolonged drone strikes. I spoke with the spokesperson for uh, the Ukrainian Air Force, and here's what he told me about their stockpiles. Do you think that the Russians could run out of missiles, run out of drones? On the drones, it depends on how many Iran would be able to supply to Russia and how strong Western sanctions would be in reducing that supply. 
On the missiles, we see from military intelligence data that now Russians are using their untouched spares and that they are also running out of ballistic missiles. We've seen recently they are now firing and striking Ukraine with quite fresh missiles that were produced in September in, and in the summer. So just to explain, he's referring to the drones, these Shahed drones, sort of self-exploding drones. They don't drop weapons. They simply collide into their targets. These are sourced from Iran. So the question is, how many does Iran have and how much is uh, Russia spending on these? And can they keep buying all of these drones? Again, 80 just since the beginning of 2023. And in those in those big questions, I wonder if there are also any interest, any um, guidance here you can talk about on Ukraine's ability to keep defending itself as the president there, of course, has a message for the people there. Yeah, I mean, that's something that the that President Zelensky made very loud and clear. He's saying we're winning the fight against these drones and against these missile strikes. And when I spoke with that spokesperson for the Air Force, he credited U.S. and other Western European provided uh, anti-air systems. Yamish? And Matt, uh, such great reporting always from you from Ukraine. So thank you so much and please stay safe. Thank you. And thank you for being with us this hour. We'll be back with more tomorrow of Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Tom Costello in for Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.